Hey, I'm Hannah Trigwell. I was lucky enough to get the chance to speak to the music production wizard that is Warren Hewart from Produce Like a Pro on an episode of Backstage Pass podcast, which is a music business podcast that I host for Tommen. We had a really good chat about getting into music production and what his top tips were for beginner producers. He's a multi-platinum producer. He's worked with the likes of James Blunt, The Fray... Aerosmith and many more. I mean, who better to talk to about production? Music production was a bit of a mystery to me when I first got into making music. And through watching tutorials from people like Warren on YouTube and being in songwriting sessions with different writers, it's really opened my eyes over the years to how much work goes into creating a hit record. I believe that the song itself is the most important part because there needs to be a solid foundation before you can bring out the best of the song through things like production, mixing, mastering, and an incredible recording. In terms of getting hands-on with creative choices and crafting a song from scratch, music production is one of the main things on the making hit record ladder that still intrigues me the most. I'm super grateful to Warren for taking the time to talk to me about this. And I want to share my highlights from this awesome conversation that we had. So I hope you enjoy the video. How did you first get into music? My dad, when I was really young, like little, little, bought me Queen A Night at the Opera. And that was a big deal because my father was a, was a painter and a sculptor. The, ha the house was all full of art and paintings and stuff. And the only music that was played constantly was being played was classical music with some jazz. So him giving me a rock and roll album, a rock album when I was little, I mean like little, little, is pretty crazy. And he said, this is worthy. Like, it's okay to listen to this. The old days of vinyl um, was, you know, you would put side one on and you would listen to the side one, maybe for two weeks. And for like two weeks, you'd just be obsessed with it and you'd be reading all the liner notes and reading everything. And then you'd flip it over and listen to side two and then do that for a week or two and then go back to side one and go, oh God, I forgot how good this was. <laughs> and that, that was that first record. I didn't get a guitar until I was 15 and that was the first time I ever played it. My dad built it with my help. And of course it was completely driven by that, that idea of building a guitar with, you know, like Brian May did with his father. I think it took him like a month or two. Yeah. Wow. I mean, do you still you know, have it? So, uh, that's a long story. I know where it is, but I don't currently have it in my possession. That's what I say about most of the things that I own. <laughs> so were you a guitarist first and then did you play in a band? Oh, yeah, I was in loads of bands. Yeah, I played I played guitar, um, although I actually, the first success I had, proper success I had, was as a bass player. When I was playing guitar as a little kid, you know, 15, 16, sorry if anybody's watching, I didn't mean 15, 16 as a little kid, but when I first <laughs> started playing, you know, I was really into, like, being great at guitar, you know, so it was all sort of, you know, very... You know, shreddy kind of stuff. Nice. Well, then rolls in the 90s and being really good at shredding and all that kind of stuff and sweep picking and everything is not not hip. You know what I mean? Everything was Nirvana and, uh, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff, which is great. You know, those bands were amazing. But, you know, being being really good at guitar was not really an attribute. You know, you sort of had to hold. And so... Um, a friend of mine, uh, Pat Shannon, who I was just chatting with on WhatsApp earlier, he said to me, oh, we need a bass player. Do you fancy playing bass? And I was like, sure. So he lent me this bass, and I believe it was one of Phil Lynott's old basses. Long story. Thin Lizzy, <laughs> Phil Lynott. And I went and auditioned. And instead of being Mr. Shred, you know, and, and yeah, <laughs> doing all kind of clever stuff, I literally was just like... And just played downbeat, root notes, and I got the gig. And we had some success. We had a, we had a, one single or two singles in the charts back in the mid-90s. The band was called Star 69, for anybody who wants to look that up and have a laugh. Um, I had bleached blonde <laughs> hair. I had, a, I had a bass. I had a really nice one, a music man. But Don Smith goes, try this P bass out. And he gives me this like vintage P bass. We have an Ampeg set up, all mic'd up, ready to go. The tone is just phenomenal. And that compression, I remember just hitting that and going, bum. I'm just being like, what happened? How did, where did that come from? It's just that, that feeling of being in a studio for the first time with great musicians, mm. a great engineer, you know, great production, you know, great room, great gear, like you were saying. All of those things are just like 
Huh. You know, I've used this quote a lot, but the Segovia quote, which I'm totally paraphrasing and is completely wrong, but something where he said all of my good students gave up. What he what he was saying, and I'm sure it's a lot, I'm just paraphrasing it, was when things come easily, people give up. It takes a lot of being kicked over and bashing into a wall oh, yeah. and getting back up again. <laughs> yeah. I've pushed against so many walls. It is my job, and this is a good conversation to talk if, we, if we're going to have producers listening to this or potential producers. It is my job to bring out what's great from somebody and exaggerate it and make more of it. Yeah. So when you send me a song and I don't know who you are, and let's just say 90% of it is like, oh, no, but... There's a piece at the bridge and I'm like, that's a really good melody. Oh, and I love I love the way the vocal did this or did that. My email back is, yeah, you know, the, the, song, the song needs a lot of work, but go to that second line in the bridge. You see what you did there and you went into a falsetto? It's the only time in the song that you did the falsetto and that's where your voice sounds amazing. Do more mm -hmm. of that. And that's my job as a producer. To me, it's really important that people feel valued in their in, – in, in what they do. Kurt Cobain, do you think Kurt Cobain was going, well, you know, you see, I'm using the Phrygian Lydian over the so-and-so. When he, <laughs> when he went a 1-4 kind of dumb thing and then moved it up a minor third, he didn't say any of those words I just said. Yeah. He did not go, I'm doing a 1-4 and I'm going to move it up a minor third. 1-4. <laughs> he just went. But what if he did, though? What if he did? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind technical. I love technical playing. Mm. You know, I absolutely love technique. I love it all. I mean, you, I love all that stuff. The thing is, is like, um, I think we're just in that sort of bubble at the moment where there's just this massive influx of, of, of everything being about technical and overanalyzing everything. I need another cup of tea. <laughs> Got my PG tips going. PG t Oh, where's your Yorkshire tea, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know Warren Sokol, a mastering engineer friend of mine, was able to remove um, a foot thump in something that wasn't in time. Sometimes like having wow. that, you know, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. It can be really cool. But if they're thumping out of time and then <laughs> and then you have like other instruments in there, you know, he, he used the isotope on one of our tracks once and just literally pinpointed that particular noise that was coming in it was remarkable i've seen miracles heard miracles i should say <laughs> i had one guitar lesson with a jazz guitar player in england called esmond selwyn who's a really famous jazz guitar player and very very good and i remember i think he was in wales and it took me like two and a half hours to drive to his house for a one hour lesson he was meditating when i arrived like i arrived like 45 minutes early i didn't know how long the drive was going to be i asked him i said so do you meditate and he's like yes i meditate it helps me be focused and you know when i'm practicing and playing and stuff like that i'm super focused and and, mm. and you know gave me a lot of reasons why and he said well how often do you practice and i was like you know at that point i was obsessed I'm still obsessed, but, you know, get, uh, there wasn't anything else in my life except for playing guitar. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I, you know, I play like six to ten hours a day, a day, depending on, you know, how my hand holds up and all that stuff. And he goes, you don't need to learn meditation. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you're meditating. You know, because you're just in ah. that zone on your own, just focused in on one task. And what is the best lesson that you've learned in your career so far? I think what we've been intimating in our conversation, which is treat everybody the same, being dismissive of somebody that's new or the opposite and just as bad, like walking around on like tender hooks, being like, oh my God, you're so amazing. You've got to be yourself. You've got to be yourself. <laughs> the way we're talking to each other here is how Eric and I talk. It's how I talk to everybody. You've got to learn and it takes time. You've just got to be comfortable enough in yourself to be yourself. And then people either, mm. they, maybe they won't like you, maybe they will. But the reality is, is that you won't have to have this pretension and play these games of trying to be like the, you know, oh my God, I'm going to treat this person with deference because they're famous. <laughs> it doesn't work. Have the confidence in your own ability. If somebody puts you in a room and they want to work with you, that's 99% of the battle has already been won. As that old phrase has been around for a billion years, you know, 99% of the job is just showing up. So yeah. if you can own that and realize that really is the truth, then you can walk into every situation with enough confidence to just be yourself. And that's the biggest thing you can do. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe if you want to see more and I will see you next time.